In a prior chapter of this playlist, I introduced you to a barebone circuit that can log data to an Internet of Things website known as ThingSpeak using cellular networks. I then explained how to build a solar-powered enclosure for the same, but what if you want to deploy in remote areas where there's no cellular coverage? In this case, the Iridium satellite network offers a reasonable alternative for logging data from anywhere on the face of the planet. To help you deploy this option, I'll summarize a hardware configuration for remote environmental monitoring using a RockBlock modem, a $10 microcontroller, and a cheap water sensor available through eBay. Details presented here will build upon how to use an Arduino to detect the presence or absence of water using inexpensive water sensors and lessons learned from prior deployments. I'll then summarize a new Arduino sketch that improves on prior iterations while also being sensitive to the higher costs associated with satellite telemetry. With all that said, let's get started. We'll start with an Arduino IDE compatible microcontroller for driving a RockBlock satellite modem. I'll be using Adafruit's 3V Pro Trinket since I'm familiar with this hardware, but you're welcome to use any 3V microcontroller that best fits your needs. I would avoid using a 5V microcontroller since the associated logic levels may not register flows if your circuit is powered off a 3.7V LiPo battery, as will be discussed shortly. You may also consider adding an OLED display to help you with debugging when your hardware isn't tethered to your laptop. This is not required for a successful deployment, but it's definitely nice to have in order to easily confirm telemetry when you deploy. For my circuit, I've selected Adafruit's OLED Featherwing, which provides a nice, compact, bright display and can be driven by a Pro Trinket. If you decide not to use this OLED, you can edit out references in the code and the wiring diagram. The following screenshots demonstrate how you will wire the OLED to your breadboard in Pro Trinket. This shows where to attach power. And this shows how to attach the display to your microcontroller so that it can be driven using I2C protocol. And this shows how to wire the OLED display and Pro Trinket to a proto board. Note that I have pin 11 on the Pro Trinket attached to the power supply driving the display. Pin 11 will be pulled high when the OLED is powered. This gives me a way to determine status of the OLED in code as to whether it's on or off. Although not clearly visible in this and other slides, don't forget to add a 10K pull-down resistor on pin 11 should you wish to add the OLED to your circuit. In this and future slides, you may also notice this resistor and capacitor attached to the power rail. This is a noise filter recommended for use with ultrasonic sensors manufactured by Maxbotic. Although I'm not using an ultrasonic sensor in this demo, adding a noise filter to the power supply for our sensors can't hurt, and it won't cause any problems for our water sensor, but it is optional. For flow detection, I'll be using these cheap water sensors available on eBay. These can be purchased from US retailers at significant markup or if you can wait a few weeks for shipping, you can purchase these from overseas at a significant discount. For your field deployment, you'll want to make sure you encase the sensor in some kind of housing to protect it from rain and or gravel and rocks in suspended storm flows. I found PVC pipe to be an excellent option that's easy to work with. PVC pipe is good because it can be used to elevate the sensor above grade so that telemetry can be initiated when flow occurs at a given stage. This design holds up to the elements and flow fairly well. Here's an example of a sensor deployed for over a year on an ephemeral drainage in southeastern Arizona. Returning to our circuit, this is how we will wire the sensor to the breadboard. You can see here that the sensor has three pins, two for power and one for signal. The signal pin will be attached to digital pin three on the Pro Trinket as an input to register the state of the sensor as either being true for wet or false for dry. Alternatively, you can also use pin three to call an interrupt function to set a flag. We won't be using interrupts in the demonstration I'll share, but I do have code in the description of this video in the event you prefer this alternative. 
One lesson learned from prior deployments is that a wet sensor should realize at least a 2-volt signal for the digital pin to consistently register true on a 3.3-volt microcontroller. If the signal is less than 2 volts, it can be hit or miss as to whether your flow event is captured. In the event of the water sensor selected for this setup, the output voltage will be a function of the input power supply which for my field deployments is a 3.7 volt LiPo battery sustained by a solar panel. Note that the voltage signal can be affected by the mineral content of water, with higher dissolved solids promoting a stronger signal. On that note, you don't want to use distilled water to test your sensor signal response. For your reference, these are the logic levels associated with a 5 volt microcontroller. In this case, your sensor has to produce at least a 3-volt signal to consistently ensure your digital pin registers true in the presence of water. This may be difficult to do if your sensor is running off a 3.7-volt LiPo battery. Since the specifications for these sensors do not report output voltage, I decided to run some tests on the signal response of this water sensor when using a LiPo battery and tap water. My tests show that in this configuration, optimal logic performance is better realized using a 3-volt microcontroller as opposed to one that runs on 5 volts. This is why I recommended using the 3-volt Pro Trinket instead of a 5-volt microcontroller when testing for the presence or absence of water using these sensors. Another lesson learned is that if you try to power these sensors directly off a digital pin on your microcontroller rather than your power rail, the resulting wet signal will put you in the floating range for a 3-volt microcontroller, so I don't recommend doing this. I mention this for those of you interested in using a digital pin to power and turn these sensors on and off, as I've tried doing in the past. I've found this doesn't give consistent, repeatable results, but if you want this flexibility, you can always pulse a transistor off a digital pin for use as a digital switch. Details regarding transistors as power amplifiers are summarized in my Introduction to Arduino playlist with a direct link in the description of this video. Moving on to the telemetry hardware, I'll summarize details for using both the 9602 and 9603 rock block modems, with a recommendation that you go with the 9603 for field deployments when your power supply is a LiPo battery. Both rock blocks come with an onboard antenna, but for field deployments in canyons or wooded areas, I recommend one of these external helical antennas, which will give you some flexibility with your installation to maximize visibility of the sky and satellite constellations. For the 9602, we will hook up the RX and TX pins on the modem to pins A1 and A2 on the Pro Trinket, for software serial communication. And we'll also need to attach the on-off pin on the modem to pin four on the Pro Trinket so that we can put the modem to sleep during the waiting period of our telemetry interval. The lithium ion and ground pins will be hooked up directly to the anode and cathode of our protoboard rail respectively. And this is what the circuit looks like with our modem added to the mix. And here are all the components for the completed circuit. You'll notice here that I've added an inductor between the rock block modem and lithium ion pin and the power rail. This is to help temper the current draw from the 9602 for charging its massive onboard capacitor, which can result in the LiPo battery's current protection circuit kicking in and shutting down your power. If this happens, you'll need to prime the capacitor by turning the power on the circuit on and off. This is demonstrated in a clip from a prior video, which is presented here. So uh, when first powering this up, if the modem has been unplugged for a while and the capacitor is fully discharged, um, the circuit may actually try to uh, draw too much current off that LiPo. And you'll see this little green light right here just flash on for a second and flash off. That means that that charge protection circuitry is kicked in. And the way to get around that is just when you plug in the battery, if that happens, don't insert this all the way. Just kind of uh, close the connection gently. And what you'll do is you'll just uh, disconnect it, connect it, disconnect it, connect it several times. And eventually uh, the Arduino will come on. What you're doing is each time you connect and disconnect, you're slowly adding a little bit of charge to this capacitor. 
until it gets to the point where it's not drawing so much current uh, off that LiPo battery. So essentially it's kind of like priming the pump. Um, that shouldn't be a problem if the, uh, if the modem's been used recently and there's some charge left in it, but if these modems have been shipped um, from Great Britain and they've been sitting for a while and you plug them in the first time and you try powering them off these LiPos, that's just something that uh, I kind of discovered um, the hard way, so I thought I'd share that with all of you. And uh, this is the 9602 model modem, and I'm informed that the 9603s that, that uh, Rockblock currently produces no longer have this issue. So uh, this thing has been in sleep mode for three hours. I just checked the voltage on it. It was a little over four volts. So the sleep mode on this, uh, on for the uh, Iridium library that's been written to work with the Arduino, actually keeps the, uh, the uh, capacitor charged over time. So that's a good thing. With respect to the 9603, the pinouts on the modem are the same, but you'll need to purchase or build one of these accessory cables to facilitate hooking up the harness on the rock block to your Pro Trinket. There's a link for purchasing this cable in the description of this video. And to make things a little easier for your build, here are the colors on the accessory cable mapped out to their respective pins on the rock block based on documentation provided by the vendor. And here's another view showing the color-coded wiring as it relates to the Pro Trinket. In the following slides, I'll go over the code used in the demonstration with attention given to the most relevant parts that you may wish to modify for your own deployments. In this video, I've included references for two sketches that you may download, edit, and use under Creative Commons license. Today, I'll only be reviewing the first sketch, which uses a polling method for determining presence or absence of water. Let's start with the most important global variables. Telem interval determines how frequently the REM should send data to the Internet of Things via your rock block modem, irrespective of field conditions. This is important for confirming system voltage and just knowing that your deployment is still functioning particularly since field equipment is subject to being vandalized or damaged by environmental conditions. Normally I'd set this to 24 hours, but for the purposes of this demo, it's set to 30 minutes or 1,800,000 milliseconds. Polling interval determines how frequently the state of flow in the channel should be checked. As currently programmed, the state is checked once every minute or 60,000 milliseconds. If flow is present in the channel, this will be the frequency that flow is being reported to the Internet of Things. So consider this to be the temporal resolution of your hydrograph. A smaller number will give you better resolution, but will also be more expensive to maintain since each data post will rack up charges on your RockBlock account. I'll demonstrate this and associated caveat shortly. Finally, I've defined my trigger to be three, which is the pin that my water sensor signal output is connected to. And in our setup block, we've defined the My Trigger pin, or pin 3 for this demonstration, to be of the type input, since we'll be monitoring the signal generated by the water sensor on this pin. Also, make sure to pay attention to the Set Power Profile function setting. When running the circuit off a LiPo or in the field, set it to zero. But if you're testing the entire circuit off a USB power supply, set it to one to account for lower current as per comment shown in the code. Note that on the Pro Trinket, pin 3 can also be used as an interrupt pin. There are applications for when you might want to use the interrupt service request for tracking the state of flow and initiating telemetry. If you're interested in learning more about interrupts, these are referenced in the video Integrating an Arduino with a RockBlock Satellite Modem and Hawk Auto Sampler, which can be found in the description of this video. When I start my loop function, the first thing I'll check is the state of my sensor by calling the flowSense function. This function just sets the variable flow detected to true or false, depending on the state of my trigger pin, which the water signal pin is attached to. The flowSense function will also store the state of flow the last time the loop function was called, in the event there's been a change from wet to dry. At the top of my loop function, I'll also record the time that has elapsed since the program started. This will be important for determining if my telemetry interval has expired for the purpose of sending an update to the Internet of Things via my satellite modem. In retrospect, I probably should have given this variable a more intuitive name, like time elapsed. Feel free to edit this code as you see fit. 
and then I'll report the status of variables of interest to my serial terminal if one is available. This can help with debugging should it be necessary. And finally, I'll test a conditional to determine if conditions are right for initiating telemetry. Telemetry will be initiated if my hardware has just been turned on, if my telemetry interval has been exceeded, if flow has been detected during my polling interval, or if there's been a change from wet to dry conditions. Within the conditional, I'll reset the time point of reference for my telemetry interval check. Next, I'll turn on and initiate communication with the rock block modem. I'll read the voltage on the system and store both flow and voltage status in string variables, which will be amended to a string that will be posted to the rock block servers. Posting will take place using the adaptive retry function, which will attempt telemetry up to five different times should the first attempt not work. If telemetry fails, field parameters will be stored for posting on the next telemetry attempt once the telemetry interval has expired or if flow is detected during the polling interval. Finally, we'll put the modem to sleep and exit the conditional. In the event conditions for telemetry are not met, I'll simply delay for my polling interval before returning to the top of the loop to check in again on the conditional. Next, I'll go over some of the AT commands and responses that the adaptive retry function in my Arduino sketch will echo to the serial terminal when trying to realize telemetry. This is a summary of some of the output you'll see in your serial terminal window when queuing and sending your message to the rock block gateway for posting to your Internet of Things website, such as ThingSpeak. This is fairly typical of output, so let's go over some of these commands. In order to understand these inputs and outputs, we need to go over the AT command reference published by Iridium. This is a fairly lengthy document, and I won't go over the whole thing, but I will focus on the commands and responses initiated by the adaptive retry function during a typical telemetry attempt. Here, we can see that the first AT command issued by the Pro Trinket to the rock block modem is SBDWT for queuing our field data to the modem for transmission. In the case of the Arduino sketch, the text is battery voltage in millivolts, followed by flow state, where zero means no flow, and a required terminating character of zero to indicate the message is complete. And the response we should see is a zero and OK if the message is queued in the modem properly. And here we can see that the message was sent to the modem without issue. Next, we'll issue the AT command SBDIX in order to have the modem send the message to our satellite for relay to the Iridium gateway and posting to our Internet of Things website. Here is the documentation formally describing the SBDIX AT command Again, confirming that if a message has been queued up, it will be sent to the Iridium gateway. And here are some responses copied from a recent test. Here you can see that we are receiving the SBDIX MO code 32 several times over. This indicates that the modem is having trouble communicating with uh, satellites, either because of antenna placement or because the satellite constellation is not optimal for transmission. An adaptive retry function in my code will attempt to send the message up to five times if the modem receives this response. And if all goes well, we'll eventually receive the MO code zero, which indicates our message was transferred successfully to the Iridium gateway. The gateway recognizes the modem transmitting the data and for my particular application is configured to send that data to an Internet of Things website known as ThingSpeak. If you're using ThingSpeak for your posts, you'll configure your ThingSpeak channel to receive the field data as per instructions outlined in my video, Arduino Introduction to the Internet of Things, included in the description of this video. Note that your delivery address configured on the RockBlock gateway will be associated with the right API key for the receiving channel, which will look something like this. This will result in the gateway updating the respective Internet of Things website with your data. You can then configure different apps like If This Then That and Twilio available through your IoT service provider to send notifications to your cell phone or through email if certain conditions are met, such as if the sensor state is equal to 1 indicating flow. 
You can also configure the Iridium Gateway to send uh, emails to you in the event of a data post. That pretty much sums up how the provided code works. In these next few slides, I'll condense 90 minutes of sensor and telemetry testing into just a few minutes. And here's the setup for the test. As per the circuit diagram I've already shared, I have a RockBlock 9603 modem being driven by a 3 volt Pro Trinket, both of which are being powered by a 3.7 volt lithium ion battery. During the test, my water sensor will be submerged in a cup of water, and I'll monitor the state of telemetry on my laptop through a serial terminal window, as well as a channel I've set up on ThinkSpeak. In this demonstration, I'll post the results of both the Serial Terminal and ThinkSpeak channel as the sketch runs through its loop. When I first power up the circuit, the setup variable will be set up as a global variable equal to 1. At the top of my loop function, I'll check the condition of my sensor through a simple flow sense function. Then I'll set the loop start time to the time that has passed since the program started and echo back some parameters for debugging. Since this is my first run through the loop, the setup variable will be equal to one. This will allow me to pass the conditional statement and begin the algorithm for telemetry. The reason I want to initiate telemetry immediately is I want to ensure that my installation is adequate for telemetry, particularly with respect to antenna placement. And here's the result. As it now stands, my sensor is out of the water and the field data is queued up and transmitted successfully to ThingSpeak via the Iridium Gateway. Note that my sensor state graph recorded a value of zero, which is the same as false for the state of the pin attached to that sensor. Assuming my telemetry interval didn't time out, my setup variable will be set to zero since I'm no longer testing my setup. If all worked out okay, my system will now wait until the sensor is wetted or the telemetry interval has expired. Upon my next run through the loop, I'll start checking the time elapsed since my last telemetry attempt. If I've exceeded my telemetry interval, I'll be able to enter the conditional block again to initiate telemetry. As shown in my serial terminal output, you can see that the required telemetry interval is 1,800,000 milliseconds which I'm approaching as I increment through my polling intervals set to one minute. Before my telemetry interval is reached, let's see if I can realize telemetry by wetting my sensor. Here you can see that my elapsed time since my last transmission is still less than my telemetry interval, but I've wetted my sensor in the cup of water. This initiates telemetry since the respective conditional requirement is met. In response, I can see initiation of telemetry as demonstrated in my serial output. And here's the result of that telemetry attempt. I've added a new data point to my ThinkSpeak graph as per successful transmission of data to the Iridium Gateway, confirmed via output in my serial terminal. As long as the sensor's wet, the conditional will continue to attempt posting data on a frequency equal to my polling interval. Here you can see another point has been posted, but it took longer than the expected minute defined by my polling interval. This suggests that the modem had trouble communicating with satellites, resulting in multiple attempts, thus taking longer than expected. Having said that, I was running this test indoors near a large window rather than outdoors with a clear view of the sky. I did this on purpose in order to test the adaptive retry function for locations in southern Arizona that may have limited visibility of the sky such as in canyons or in washes. Even though I was indoors, the 9603 modem and antenna performed relatively well, taking only a little more than five minutes for this particular post on a one minute telemetry interval. And here are a few more data posts. I'm actually surprised how well I'm able to transmit data from indoors on a one minute polling interval, although there are some expected time gaps between posts. If my polling interval had been greater than one minute, these gaps would be even greater and could potentially bias the predicted temporal length of my hydrograph when I removed the sensor from the cup. On that note, let's simulate our flood stage falling below the elevation of the sensor. This is something we want to capture in our data in order to approximate flood duration at the stage of the sensor. 
To realize the post, we'll use this part of the conditional to trigger telemetry, which will happen when the sensor dries after being wetted. Here you can see our last data post showing the sensor was wet and that a change in the sensor state initiated a new telemetry attempt, just as expected. And here's the data post showing that the sensor's dry and giving us an approximate flood duration of about 48 minutes at the given stage. Again, keep in mind that if your setup is in a canyon or heavily vegetated area with poor visibility of the sky and your polling interval is coarse, you risk biasing the calculated length of your hydrograph. At the same time, decreasing the time required for your polling interval can increase costs, all things to keep in mind when writing your code and pursuing your installation. Just as before, the conditional in our loop function will continue polling the state of the sensor on the given polling interval until the telemetry interval is passed or until flow is detected once again. Here you can see time elapsing on each polling interval. Until the telemetry interval of 30 minutes is exceeded. I'm now ready to transmit the state of the sensor independent of whether or not it's been wetted based on my telemetry interval, which is currently set to 30 minutes. And here's the result after the telemetry interval has expired. The loop start time minus reset loop time is reset to zero in the code, and we'll start waiting once again for the telemetry interval to pass. And here we go again. Our elapsed time slowly increases with each polling interval. Rather than wait another 30 minutes, let's keep things interesting by wetting the sensor again in order to reinitiate telemetry. And here you can see that although our telemetry interval hasn't been exceeded, we will attempt transmission again as a result of our sensor getting wet. In this case, my adaptive retry function failed, likely because of my testing this setup indoors coupled with the less than ideal constellation of satellites visible through my kitchen window. But as long as the sensor is wet, the conditional will attempt telemetry again after the next polling interval to include posting old data from the prior missed posts. We'll again see that our wet sensor during our polling interval will trigger transmission, and eventually we'll post data to our Internet of Things website. To conclude this test, we'll dry the sensor before the telemetry interval has expired. This will initiate another transmission and a successful post to our Internet of Things website showing that the sensor is now dry. And again, telemetry will be put on hold until our telemetry interval expires or a flow is detected during one of our polling intervals. As long as no flow is detected, our telemetry will wait until the telemetry interval is exceeded once again. Although this iteration of code has not been formally field tested, I feel pretty good about this test and hope to deploy a new pilot shortly in one of our ephemeral washes. In the interim, feel free to download this code, improve on it, and share ideas in the comment section of this video. Since I'm not an electrical engineer and mainly self-taught, all constructive feedback, positive or negative, is welcome. In a future video, I'll summarize how you can modify the cellular remote environmental monitoring code I've shared to use less expensive cellular networks to detect flow or soil moisture in an ephemeral wash through analog rather than digital signals. Thanks for watching and please subscribe for updates.